Hello, my name is Sherilyn Van Kirk, and I'm founder of Starflower Organic Skin Care. And I'm standing at our Starflower Retreat in front of our first biodynamic compost pile. And as you can see, we already have a tomato plant very healthily growing out of it. And this was made six months ago by Rand Carter, who is a biodynamic aficionado here in Sarasota. He travels around the country and he learns from other biodynamic farmers and gardeners and does hands-on experience with them. So he's brought his expertise down to Sarasota and he will be helping us create more biodynamic compost piles and creating our herb garden and our vegetable garden for us. And uh, he showed us everything he's doing and all the ingredients he put in for uh, Florida soil. So you'll see that in a few minutes. And if you'd like to know more about biodynamics, go to biodynamics.com and you'll, you'll read everything you need to know about it and the philosophy and so forth. So without further ado, let us go to Rand and he'll show us what he put in this compost pile. In the foreground here is the uh, most delightful part and usually the part that attracts uh, most of the attention. Some flies also, it's uh, cow manure. In this case, we're using cow biodynamic cow manure, which is following the uh, Rudolf Steiner, uh, Aaron Fried Pfeiffer methodology of composting. There's probably a half a dozen types of composting and every one of them has its value uh, the uh, biodynamic compost is driven towards a humus product and uh, which takes a year or two for that humus to be created and we've got some humus balls around here but not sitting right beside me so I can't show them to you anyway uh, but that's where the most nutrient part of uh, composting comes from so a lot of the uh, compost that you're able to purchase for twenty dollars a yard is really really nice mulch and not compost so there's an education part of composting that uh, that is intricate so anyway here we've got the manure three barrels of the manure here's some existing compost which is not quite as uh, if it was really in the humic state then I would be able to ball that up into a ball and bounce it and it wouldn't come apart so this is some nice biodynamic compost we add that compost to the compost pile because of the uh, uh, different uh, uh, bacteria and uh, and fungal properties that are already in it. So uh, um, this we brought down from, I brought down from Virginia. It's a biodynamic clay. So uh, one of the problems in Florida, of course, is that we have virtually a, a sort of a clay, but not a clay that works well for growing food in. So we have some limitations in Florida with our Florida sand, which in this case, to make this biodynamic compost pile, what we did is we dug out about six inches of the uh, existing dirt. So that's been sifted through a uh, uh, 3 8 inch sifting uh, to get most of the uh, grassy, woody stuff because we need it uh, uh, to add to the compost pile because of the existing bacteria and soil life that's already in here that uh, helps the composition uh, decomposition process. So each of these three layers that I've showed you goes on as a light dusting as we build this compost pile, which is lasagna style. And that means it's basically, we're using the same ingredients over and over and over. In this case, we have a five foot by 15, uh, five foot by uh, eight foot, uh, 48 inch tall compost pile that we're making. It's, a, uh, it's uh, fenced in with uh, rabbit wire to hold the contents in. If this was more of a farm-like environment, we would be building a windrow, which is, doesn't have a, uh, any sort of enclosure on it. The other ingredient that's, uh, if you're interested in composting, the other component is what, what you basically do is look to see what your resources are uh, available to you and then capitalize on that, and particularly with paying attention to the carbon-nitrogen ratio. This is Coffee Grounds by one of the big uh, coffee manufacturers. You can see that the, uh, the little hockey pucks are still here from the espresso machines. They're sort of a nuisance in the sense that if I put that in the compost pile, when I go to harvest it, 
I'll find these little hockey pucks. So we usually have to crush them up. And again, we're using that as a light dusting on each layer as we go up. Now, uh, the proper way would be to, oh, and uh, this, this other more important uh, carbon aspect is leaf mulch that's been sitting for a couple years. It's oak leaves and pine needles. You can still see the pine needles. They don't break down very well, but this is just a natural process of a pile of materials put together with some manure and let sit for a period of time. It's really quite delightful in the sense of building compost, but we only found one snake egg and one worm in this pile that's been sitting. So it's not a food source for worms. I'm sure bacteria and, uh, and fungi are, are, uh, are doing well in that. So uh, when we dug up the process, we actually sifted it through a 3 8 inch screen attached to the wheelbarrow. This was the part that didn't go through the sifter. So we'll use that in light sprinkling. But if I was to take anything like a bunch of leaves or pine, pine uh, uh, bark or without going through the process of breaking it down, it ends up just creating a rubber mat, if you may, and nothing happens in that rubber mat. So it has to be broken down. Uh, let's see, some of the other components here are some, is some uh, granite dust that uh, brought back from, uh, from uh, uh, Cal uh, Georgia. And I'm not sure if you'll see it. It's rather delightful in the sense that it has a lot of mica in it. So perhaps you can see some of the sparkles in this white dusting process that I'm talking about. That was just for show and tell. I'll add a little bit more. Uh, one of the uh, aspects, another uh, material that we're putting in is azomite. Azomite also helps move this towards a clay type of soil. So anytime you, I made the first mistake of a stupid human trick of adding clay to my front yard. I brought in a bunch of clay, I dried it all out, I sifted it down to a fine powder, covered my whole yard with it, and then I noticed that my yellowish colored carpet started getting an orange tint to it. And then the first time it rained, I realized that all of the powdered clay that I'd put down had floated up to the top and now coated all over the driveway. It was quite a mess. So anytime you want to incorporate any kind of material or anything into your yard, put it in your compost pile, let all the critters do the work for you, and then it assimilates into your garden and soil uh, much more appropriately. This, uh, this is a uh, coral calcium. Uh, it comes from, uh, from uh, one of the sunken Navy ships at Pearl Harbor. So what they do is they go in and they harvest, it's a sustainable product, they harvest the uh, coral off of the ships, grind it up, turn it into a calcium, and it's supposedly a calcium that's ready available to the plant. And then the other one that's a little bit controversial is this uh, chitin or crab, this crab life. It's a ground up crab and lobster shell. And you add that to your soil, it's supposed to chase away the nematodes, which is one of our big issues. And let's see, so I've got uh, Southern Organic Supply, supplies these different products. Uh, this is the Vermiplex, which is a, uh, a combination, almost like a, a tea. It's one of the best products I've ever used for soil life or plant life. Uh, this uh, black sea kelp. I've tried going down to the beach, harvesting uh, seaweed and uh, bringing it in and find the seaweed just sort of sits on top of the compost pile and uh, not quite sure, you know, so this just makes it a lot easier. Well, I'm going to keep continuing playing around with that. And then the liquid humate, which helps move us towards uh, a, a product that's more like humus. And then uh, something like uh, 35 boxes, banana boxes of vegetables will go into this pile. So 1,500 pounds of, uh, of veggie scraps that would otherwise go to the landfill is now going to go into creating this pile. So let me show you uh, one layer of how the pile comes together. Here's the fun part. As an older sister used to say, there's only two things that smell bad in the world. That's death and dying. This is manure. It's not death. It's not dying. <laughs> so, but everybody would have a tendency to want to argue 
and go yik, but if you're uh, crazy enough to uh, be interested in composting, which we all should be, then uh, you just have to kind of deal with it. So it's got some of its delights. I love the sound of slosh slosh. You have to kind of pick an old pair of shoes and kind of get over the fact that you're going to get some on you. And uh, after a period of time, I sort of get into uh, enjoying the sounds of it. So, Rand, just take us through. Um, so, the next, uh, so in layering, uh, where do the vegetables come in after you put this slosh? Well, I find that, uh, especially when I'm doing, so I'm, I've, I've learned from the farmers of how to do it on large scale. And then I'm trying to figure out how to temper that down to bring it into people's backyards because if everybody was making their own compost and growing their own food, it would be a much better planet and a much better lifestyle. So if I was out on the farm, I wouldn't really care about farms or as, as flies or smells or or uh, any of those. So I try to use a system that gets the manure down mm -hmm. and then start covering it over. So if I was, if it's really desperate or the humidity is low and I'm finding that the smell is traveling over and people are sticking their heads out in the backyard, that's when I'll move in fairly quickly with the, uh, with the uh, uh, coffee grounds. So the coffee ground well, if there is a fly issue, as soon as I get the coffee grounds down, then the flies go away. So usually, coffee on top of the manure. It's much easier to take if we had, uh, had a little, got a little bit. There's always something to forget about in this process, but if you uh, sift this through a uh, sifting device, uh, just a piece of screen on top of your wheelbarrow, then you don't have to do all this extra grinding that I'm doing because I'm trying to break down these little hockey puck things in here that are that are the uh, that are out of the byproduct of the espresso. Mm, that coffee smells good. Isn't it nice? And you can yeah. actually get so heavy with the coffee grounds that your uh, finished compost actually smells like coffee. Which I'm not sure if that's good or not, but it does make it for an interesting conversation, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so then the coffee and then what comes, you just keep layering it with the various yep. bags you have here. When do the vegetables come in? The vegetables will probably be the last thing. Oh, this is one thing that we have here. The, uh, I don't think you can barely see them. Oh, yeah. So these what are, are these? the black soldier fly grubs. Now, most people would say they look like maggots, and mm -hmm. I guess they are in a sense a maggot. Mm -hmm. But these are a grub. They're brown, and they got the serrated edges, and they'll get to be half, three quarter inches long. And the black soldier fly is uh, is just another processor of food stuff. Uh -huh. So I can feel them tickling my fingers oh, trying to dig. I'm through. glad you got them instead of me. Sure. <laughs> have, hold a handful. <laughs> Anyway, they won't like the, the uh, compost pretty soon because it's going to get too hot for them. But they, uh, they fly down out of the trees. They do their mating up there. They fly down out of the trees and, uh, and deposit their eggs in a food source. And the, uh, the, uh, the, the, it, it, it hatches into this grub. The grub gets to a point of where it starts looking for a place to dig in and start the process over. And that's when the folks that are raising the black soldier flies to feed their chickens, they, they, you create a, 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 a pod where they live in, so they're another composter. They actually eat the food, and when they reach a certain stage, they climb up out of the pod, drop out, and the chickens already hear them scratching oh and come over, and it's a free meal for them. Okay. Um, well, so they're very. We don't have chickens yet. I no, don't think no we chickens will. Yet, but the. Uh, they're just another processor, and you know we get kind of yucky about things like vultures and grubs, and and uh, some people, everybody seems to like worms, okay. But uh, you know it would be a sad planet if we didn't have. Oh the, yeah, uh, well if we it's all in the ecosystem. Yeah. So there's my coffee ground. Here goes the uh, the uh, red clay with the sparkles in it, which I don't think will show up on the video, but there's a lot of mica in that clay out of Georgia. 
No, I'm sorry, this is the biodynamic uh, clay out of uh, Virginia. So a light dusting of that. A little bit of finished compost. And then when the uh, the compost is all finished, then uh, are you going to put some chicken wire on top as well? No, there's a, uh, you'll see that I've gone, I've started, good question, you see that I've already started with a uh, uh, hay going around the outside perimeter. So one of the things that Steiner said is anything that's alive has an inside and an outside, uh -huh. and in between it, inside and outside, is a skin. And that skin is... If you don't make a skin for your compost pile, it'll make its own skin. And its own skin is about eight inches thick, very crispy and almost porous coral-like in a sense, and, uh, and basically useless as a compost or a soil amendment. So it has to be broken down, ground up, and put back into a compost pile to be recycled. So in this case, I'm using hay or coastal hay because it really, all it's doing is providing me a, a sort of a barrier between the inside and the outside. Okay. And so it helps control moisture, temperature, and... Uh, and we, and don't, um, we don't have to worry about bunnies. Well, we've got bunnies here, and we've got birds. Yeah. And so we don't have to worry about them getting into the compost if we don't... Not a thing, because there's basically almost... I think everything's... It was explained to me that the that everything wants the same things we want. It wants a, a place to live away from the elements, a food source and a water source. And so everything is looking for that. And uh, um, in this case, the food source and the water source goes yicky in about two days. Okay. So after so. I put the vegetables in, All then right. there's about a two or three day process of if there was a problem, that or a varmint or something right. they would come in but the way these piles get built there's never any sign of any possum raccoon or anything ever i've ever had a problem and they used to go to great problem great depths of putting in wire and building and then i realized i really don't need to have to do that okay and the other idea that i don't think i talked about was it's so important to have your compost in touch with the soil just like it is growing vegetables. And I know that's a bit of an argument because we just went to certified organic hydroponic aquaponics. But from the Steiner point of view, everything has to be in touch with the soil because there's a communication that goes on between I, the soil. I totally and, get that. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so we've got the light dusting of the native soil, the, the uh, Virginia clay, the existing compost, now we'll put down some of these, uh, let's see, did we do the, we haven't done the azomite and the coral yet, I don't think. No. So these are the sort of things that, uh, this is a, uh, a clay, volcanic clay, I think, and it helps, helps enhance the, uh, uh, the, the uh, lack of clay in Florida soil. Again, it goes down as a light dusting. Uh, because I'm on video, I'm not wearing my mask, but most of the farmers, as I guess a lot of people die from uh, uh, lung problems, farmers are more prone to it because they don't wear masks. I normally, anytime I'm using any of these sort of products, I'm wearing a dust mask to re reduce my amount of exposure to the dust aspect. So that was the, uh, that was granite dust. And... Here's some of this uh, ground-up egg shells. Now, the cockroaches love this stuff. Mm. They mm. will eat holes in this plastic to get to it because of the smell, because it smells like... Protein. Yeah, and then, but they won't eat it. They just like to dig in to find out what it is. So there's that. Here's the uh, much-loved biochar, which is... Hmm burnt up wood material.
and hopefully inoculated, but in this case I'm not too worried about whether it's inoculated or not because the compost will, the critter life forms in the, uh, in the compost pile will uh, certainly uh, do whatever needs to be done. I've heard it described as a condominium for, uh, for the microbiology. That seems to make as much sense as anything else. I understand it's really good for sandy soils that we have in Florida. And then, just because the ideal thing would be to do a soil test to find out what your soil is lacking and add the amendments appropriately. In this case, I'm just going with neutral products made from Southern Supply. It's the largest organic uh, amendment supplier in, in the United States now. The first one was a product called Vermiflex. It's fantastic for putting on plants. This is a liquid humate that I just put on and uh, the black sea kelp. So you'll do that in layers as well? In each layer, okay. yeah. Okay. Great. So th that's all the soil amendments. And now we get the fun part of the veggies. So. Did I forget something over here? Got the soil, got all those products, got the coffee grounds. So I'm good to go. So now I'm going to put down the veggies. In this case, about 40 banana boxes of vegetables, um, which is a fair amount of work because of the, uh, the nature of of getting this stuff. In this case, it's a processing plant, makes a lot of pineapple, and I was told that if I use too much pineapple, that I make, make, make the compost too acidic. So, uh, stories out on that. Uh, pumpkin, tis the season of October. Uh, I'm not too worried about the bulk, about how small these parts are. They'll break down rather quickly and go into soupy, sloppy stuff. I've had a tendency to, to uh, try to minimize the amount of uh, seeds, so I scoop out all oh, the, uh, okay. all the uh, seed parts. And then the other thing, and the biggest time consumer about collecting this stuff is the, uh, is the uh, damn plastic labels. So I usually end up with one pocket designated for plastic trash. So here we go. Kind of get this sort of siphoned out. This makes the uh, makes all the flies real happy when you put this layer in. Amazing what we throw away, eh? Uh -huh. Nice little gourd. <laughs> little squashes. All with little bad spots on them. So after that you'll do the whole process again? So here and now we're so right now we're finishing up with the layer of veggies. Kind of get them all spraced out. And now I'll start off with the uh, with the uh, yicky manure part. All right. Well, you can see the pile is starting to uh, take a shape. Uh, I think with the uh, with the way that I put the stakes in and add the uh, coastal hay on the outside, creating the skin, it actually ends up looking like a giant peanut. I think that's kind of fun. So we've gone in with the with the lasagna. We've done the layers over and over. We reduce the amount of vegetables. Uh, I thought we had plenty with the amount of our boxes and we're a little bit over halfway. Remember we started a, about a foot deeper into the ground so we've already got up almost halfway. And, uh, and here's where the magic of the biodynamic uh, compost comes in. We're actually acting what's called the preps. And that's a whole other lengthy video on what the preps are. To say that the preps is a fertilizer would be a terrible thing for me to say so I didn't say that it's actually what each prep is individually created in a unique manner and what it does is it relates to the compost pile relates to the soil it simply enhances the energies that's already there and directs it in the correct way so 
one of the best things to think about in creating a compost and why you would use the preps is it's sort of like making bread. Now there's any number of microbes and, and, uh, and things on dust and sitting on countertops and things like that. So the argument is, is that you may not need these microbes or you might not need this energy in your compost pile. But if you were to create a loaf of bread, you would use a specific yeast. A specific yeast to design to make your bread and, uh, and get it to do what you want it to do. And it's the same thing with the compost pile. So the numbers of the, of the uh, preps that we're using is, uh, is uh, 50, 502 through 506. And those we can talk about, but there are the five preps and they were going to go in five different locations in the compost pile. Now, the one, of the one of the things that everybody wants to know is why do they call it 502 to 506? It started out as 500. So, Enfried Pfeiffer was basically the uh, scientist behind uh, Steiner. He brought biodynamics to the United States. And uh, the first thing he looked at is corn, uh, horn manure. And what they do is they take lactating female horn manure, stuff it in a cow's horn, and bury it for a said period of time in the soil, pull it out, and it transforms itself into a humus type of material. And it's the same thing as, you know, so this was, this is, was cow manure stuffed in a horn, and here's the transformation this has been sitting almost a year in a in, in in a stored in a peat moss stored area and still it has its vitality it's still moist it's basically colloidal in its appearance you can see the little balls of of substance so this is this has no smell of cow manure at all it smells like 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 soil nice soil from a forest or something Anyway, the 500 came from the fact that it has 500 million microbes in it. So that was the decision on why they called it 500 and then all the other things that Steiner came up with, nobody is able to figure out which book Steiner read, <laughs> who did he talk to to get this. So one has to suspect that Steiner was one of the most fascinating men of this century, well, he died uh, uh, almost 80 years ago, 80, 90 years ago, but just an incredibly brilliant man, gifted on so many levels, just incredible, uh, incredible amount of vitality and whatnot he put into so many aspects of, of life. So we don't use the 500. Uh, we use the 500 for uh, uh, the, uh, um, well, any number of uses, and it can be uh, transformed into other uses, so we use a sort of a product that's uh, 500 base for uh, for uh, treating the uh, the uh, sifted uh, 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 oak leaves, uh, we treated that with the uh, with the field spray, and uh, but that's not what I'm here to talk about right now. We're at the uh, got my little Halloween pumpkin sitting up here. So what we have, it's a little difficult to see, but I've created five piles, one in each corner and one in the middle, of peat moss. Now there's any number of ways to add the preps. This prep, one teaspoon of, of each prep, will go into each of the piles, and then I cover it over with peat moss. I make a little bed for it. It's my relationship with the prep. And sometimes people just take a post and stick a hole in the ground and dump it in there. Other people, there's three or four different methodologies. This is the one I choose. So there's methods, different ways of administering it. Um, I'm a little uh, more uh, fly-by-night seat of the pants, about a teaspoon. Maybe I'm a little heavy there. This is 502, made from yarrow. Again, it's not a simple process. This is 503, chamomile. And Rand, is there um, a, a 
directional, uh, any directional indications to the press? Certainly, you can get any number of ways. The, uh, the perhaps the most organic method is you get to decide where is the head and where is the feet of this compost pile. Aha. And then you put the, per, the particular herb in the location that most resonates with that part of the body. So I think it's brain, heart, lungs, kidneys. Yeah. I, this, this business of composting and gardening is a lifetime experience. I've been doing this for only three years. <laughs> right. So, okay. So I've got lots to learn. So, Sting okay, yeah, so, uh, so we got chamomile and yarrow, and then what this are the This is stinging nettle. This is about the simplest prep to make because other than harvesting it and grabbing hold of stinging nettle, which I didn't know about stinging nettle until I stuck my hand in there, and then I found out why they call it stinging nettle. <laughs> so that goes in basically a uh, copper screen and then buried in the ground. You don't have to stick it inside a bladder or a, you know, or any of the oddities that uh, we make little pi pillows out of the uh, fatty tissue of the cow. And anyway, it gets pretty bizarre and pretty. So this one is dandelion. Again, just basically one teaspoon. It's, it, I didn't really show you the preps, but they all sort of have this same kind of uh, look as they transform themselves into this kind of uh, colloidal uh, material, humus kind of material. So they all kind of look the same, all sort of smell the same, at least for this nose. I think other people have got more sensitive noses. So there's the, uh, the dandelion. And the last one is oak bark. Oak bark is 505. And oak bark is a pretty, pretty unique uh, prep. You basically go to an oak tree, similar to this one we're standing to right next here. It's high in calcium and interacts with the calcium. So let me put that little bottle there. You scrape the oak bark off, turn it into a sort of a sawdust, and then take a cow's head and remove all the skin off of it. Remove the brain out of the brain cavity and stuff the oak bark inside the bath cow's skull and then bury it in an area where there's a slow moving water source so uh, or moisture around and that transforms itself into this incredible substance so anyway all very strange all very unusual but the proof is in the pudding <laughs> or the proof is in how well your bread rises or in this case how well you compost whether your compost transitions from from uh, really nice uh, broken down plant matter into compost or into humus whichever whatever it is you're looking for so if you just need a whole bunch of compost then you would probably do this harvest in six months to a year if you wanted humus you might have to wait for a year or two I like working with the fresh vegetables because I don't have to add water the vegetables produce the water source it seems to be just a nice balance it's certainly not for everybody. I have a place where I can get all the vegetables I want. It took me about three days to collect these number of boxes for this pile. But uh, other places, like up in woods in Virginia, all I can do is use uh, uh, whatever green material I can find. So it's, again, you're looking at that carbon to nitrogen ratio. You look at every ingredient you're putting together. You're looking at somewhere around a 20, 20, 25% carbon to 1% nitrogen. And uh, if you can get that range, then you can uh, uh, make a really nice compost. So now that I've got that, I'm going to take the peat moss. Getting along in the day. I think I've been, uh, I've been making enough compost today that I'm starting to look like compost. So now I just simply put the little bed sheet on top of each one of the, each one of the preps.
And that's the secret ingredient to biodynamic compost pile. Now I'll go ahead and sort of, I didn't want to really disrupt that with manure or vegetables, so I'll put another little cap of the uh, broken down oak leaves over the top of that. And uh, then we'll start with the lasagna again. All right. It's, a, it's about, I'm thinking it takes about three days to bring all your ingredients together and somewhere around three, two guys, three hours to build the pile. So it's about six hours to build the pile and uh, three days of harvesting all these materials. Wow, so much TLC goes into making this. Well, and thank you for your support of compost. It's a- uh, Oh, thank you it's, it's, for it's, the work. It's, everybody so gets sort of soupy-eyed and dreamy-eyed when you say the word compost, but uh, I'm not sure where the, where the separation, whether it's the amount of work or the, uh, or the yicky parts or, you know. Well, it's, people just don't know how to make it. That's why it's, I, I think this video will, will really enlighten people. Well, good. Good so. for you and thanks for your enthusiasm. Yes.